All right, everyone, we are back after a little bit of a hiatus with episode 26 of our Eurythmics podcast, myself and the inimitable Mark Stevens, who uh, today is his birthday, by the way. So happy birthday, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, today we have a special guest who Mark is going to say more about, but it's Clem Stambaugh. Stambaugh. <laughs> we just went over this. And... Um, he needs no introduction to any Eurythmics fans. If you know people know who he is, if you've been around the forums and all that, he's a, a huge Eurythmics fan and a published poet. And we're going to hear about this, and we're going to hear about how Eurythmics has influenced his poetry. Although I'm sure there are other things that have influenced it as well, but Eurythmics is part of it. And uh, yeah, so Mark, why don't you? Um, I know you've kind of helped, been helping Clem with the whole him becoming a poet thing <laughs> and um so i'll let you talk now a little bit about it well I, i've i've not helped him become a poet i've oh, helped no. him a published poet let's put it that way i have a publishing company and uh, his uh, first book came out in 2020 uh and it was called in black and and light um and his second book of all new poetry uh actually just came out this weekend, uh, it's called uh, The Ghost of Gold. And it's an excellent, <laughs> it's giving me the thumbs up, really excellent book. Now this is, uh, uh, we worked on this together, but it uh, in the sense of having it published, uh, but this is available uh, at, um, at Amazon and Kindle and in this really beautiful hardback edition. I just got my copy today, in fact, but, um, one of the reasons that I wanted him to be a guest today, because what we're talking about today is Annie Lennox's Bear album. And I think more than any other of her albums, I, I think of this as a poetry. There's just something about, and I, quite frankly, I think it, it's very much uh, in the style of poetry that Clem writes in. But uh, uh, Rex, as you said, uh, I think Eurythmics uh, fans are going to know his name. Well, we know they do. We, we're all on the boards. But Clem and I and you and some of the other people, we go back to a Yahoo group mm -hmm. way back, even way back. before MySpace. I think Annie Lennox and Clem were the last people on MySpace. I'm almost certain of it because it took <laughs> him forever <laughs> to get to Facebook. We're all we're like, hey, where's that guy from Kentucky? Yeah. He's yeah. not here, but well, I should... the, the, the remember it was called One List way, way back. It was on Yahoo. And that was like pre like that was like post Medusa pre peace right in that yeah. period. Yeah, it was the 90s. Yeah. yeah. So it was and, weird um, because when I remember we were already all on the list when when peace was going to come out and we were all very excited about it and talking about it. Um, and then it turned into Yahoo groups later. And then along Facebook came, which kind of blew everything out of the water. Suddenly artists had their own kind of fan pages and they sort of made it all obsolete. Yeah, it, it, it is it is like that. And and I try to think back in those days and, and um, you know, and it, it, I don't think I was incredibly active on the Yahoo because what I remember about those early days of the internet that I couldn't stand how long it took you to dial up. Remember that? <laughs> and it, I just didn't have the patience for it. So, you know, when MySpace came along and then Facebook came along and it was, but even if we think about that, um, you know, all of Facebook and MySpace is not anywhere close to what it is today. You know, the social media is so much different than even then. Um, so you know, it's 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 weird when you think of just 20 years ago, how different it was and 25 years ago, how different it was. Yeah. But we're really happy to uh, just have Clem on. He's a very good friend. We have worked together um, and and we do go back. We didn't meet until, I don't know, a few years back, like all of us, you know, when I went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, event last November, can you believe it? it's almost been a year? Yeah. You know, I met a lot of people from around the world that I had never met until that to that yeah. time. So it's just yeah. it's insane and crazy how many people that's been in our lives for so long because of 
Eurythmics uh, and Dave and Annie. They brought all these people together. Uh, and so welcome, Clem, to the podcast. Oh, thank you guys so, so much. It's so great to be here. I thought today, I, I thought it was the 25th or 26th episode. I, I wasn't sure, but I followed along through the whole journey. I loved it. I loved it. I love that you keep it so conversational. Um, I feel like we can go anywhere at any time. And I, I love that spontaneity. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about poetry. And I remembered back, um, if you know a little bit about my story, I, I did this in solitude. I, I did this in privacy and writing for probably 30 or 35 years. And I remember when I was um, maybe 14 years old, uh, listening to Touch and listening to Who's That Girl and Annie talking about those China cups. I knew, I knew then I'm like, wow. Not only am I listening to someone that that her voice totally just just makes my there's an old review in Rolling Stone of, of actually the Touch album and he talks about his spine running down. You remember that it runs into a puddle on the floor behind him. So that's exactly I thought that was so accurate that, that description. But then I realized more than a voice and more than this stunningly beautiful face, there was a poet living inside Annie Lennox and. We had no idea about the tourists. I didn't know anything about the tourists. I did know, if, if any of you know my story, all these hundred years that we've been fans, um, you know that I was just a youngin', a, a little little guy when a guy in a record store, I grew up out in the country, but I was very blessed uh, out in the country to have a, a record store in a little town near me. And um, he said, hey, you like Blondie, because he knew I'd been in that store before. And he goes, hey, you like Blondie, so you're going to like that. I had no idea, you guys, how to even pronounce Eurythmics, and he didn't help, and I didn't ask. I was like, I was like 11 years old, and no clue what was going on. Well, so was, I'm like, he, oh. He was suggesting in the garden for you, right? You had a he copy was of in the garden, yeah. So I was like, um, oh, wow. um, wait a minute, I was older than 11, 13, I guess, 13, and that's that's 81, yeah, 13. So I had no no clue. Took it home, uh, put it on. Uh, yeah, it's okay. I'm going to listen to Parallel Lines, though, and eat, the beat, uh, eat to the beat. And so, but I listened to it, you know, off and on, flipped it over, listened to it off and on. But it was, I went right back to Blondie. Um, so it was a couple of years later, I came home from school. I was a latchkey kid, uh, like a lot of us, I think, in, in our generation. Yeah. And so I, I took care of myself. So I came home, flipped on. I was lucky enough to have MTV. I flipped it on. You're not going to believe this, but it was in the middle of Sweet Dreams, and I... What, is the, what did the British say? I was gobsmacked. My mouth fell open. I didn't even make the connection in the garden. I just thought, who is this woman? Oh, my God. Who is this woman on TV? And, and I you was thought messing. woman. You thought woman, not who is this guy? I No, no, no. I, I knew right. Annie Lennox was 100% We all knew woman. she was a stunningly beautiful woman. We knew that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the thing is that was so smart that we would learn later is, is how how incredibly smart to she's not going to make herself part of the male gaze. And I love that because she's untouchable. You can't do anything with her in that power suit because she's dressed just like Dave. So they're on equal footing, but you couldn't get past the fact that you are looking at, wow, th this, this woman who, I mean, had she not wanted to sing, she easily could have been probably one of the great supermodels or she could have been, you know, I, I've always thought she could have been an actress. But thank God, Annie, if you ever hear this, thank God that you took the path you took uh, and you have given us all of this music. And Dave, right by your side for so long. I mean, Mark and I have talked about this and Rex, I'm sure you and Mark have talked about this, but what those two people created in the span of eight years, it is unbelievable the amount of work and the creativity and the, my God, the production alone on these albums. And I know that sometimes these were like, what? First takes, I think we learn about touch. Um, how did they do this? It, it's phenomenal. It really is. It's phenomenal. But I know we're talking about Bear, and I'm glad we are uh, because I love this album. Yeah. Well, just before we start talking about Bear, I just want to point out, you know, you said so much uh, output in eight years. That's why I think it has lived on so so well with the fans. You know, Dave said at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, we've had these loyal fans that have been with us. We haven't done anything in over 20 years and they're still with us. That's because of the strength of the work of those eight years, plus 
the what they did in 99 as well with peace um it just endures and it's strong it's so strong anyhow uh, and i wanted to and i was and i didn't realize this until earlier today i mean i'm sure we all do but it's been 20 years since bear and it's been 40 years since sweet dreams think about that for just a minute you know the our lives that we've lived so far and uh you know how important 40 years ago but that you know that bear came out 20 years ago so halfway through that and then there was this and uh all that's just incredible to me um just that time and space i believe she talks about time and space on bear actually <laughs> yeah i often think of that about how it was uh you know in 1983 it was sweet dreams if we had been able to look into a crystal ball 20 years later it was bear you know and and I don't know why that's a thing. It's just, I guess it's because of the milestone of it, you know, 20 years since Sweet Dreams. and Right. But think about what happened in that 20 years. She also went solo, you know? I mean, by, by 1993, just eight, 10 years after Sweet Dreams, she was already an established solo artist with a hit album under her belt. And, and that, you know, again, that was in a, in a short amount of time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I... Bear came out at a, 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 such a different tune. Well, here, I'm getting some feedback a little bit. Anyway, it came out at such a different time in all of this that um, what we were talking about a moment ago with social media and stuff. So it was sort of at the beginning of all that. And, uh, uh, and uh, it just was... Um, Sorry, my computer's doing weird things. Anybody else getting that? Sorry. Uh, but it was such a, an interesting time. Uh, and I think we can talk about that. But how do we want to dive into Bear? Rex, how do you want to do this? Um, I think we should, uh, uh, Clem, if, if there's something you want to talk about personal to you for, you know, regarding Bear, regarding not only your poetry, but what, what the album and the music means to you, we could kind of start with that and then maybe um after that we could we could either go track by track or just talk about individual tracks we also want to make sure to you know leave some time to to talk about clem's new book and all that because let's let's mention really quickly if you will remember everybody the last podcast that we did and rex blew everybody's mind with something we we and oh. i don't know exactly how bear came up <laughs> Rex blew everyone's mind and he blew mine. I know a bunch of other people. He talked about listening to Bear in reverse. You go from Oh God to A Thousand Beautiful Things instead of A Thousand Beautiful Things all the way down to track 11, Oh God. And it's such a crazy different experience. So I think we should, we can dive into that some more because yeah, it's well, such a totally different experience. I'll say something <laughs> quick and then I'm. I'm sure Clem wants to talk about that too, <laughs> but um, it just seemed, you know, as I was listening to the album, I thought, you know, the, the very last song is the depth of despair. That's where you're at at the beginning of a breakup. A thousand beautiful things is where you're at when you've recovered from the breakup. So I took those two bookends and I thought, what if you just listen to it in reverse? And maybe it's not a hundred percent like following the timeline of a breakup, but it it works pretty well. I mean, it's, you know. it's, it's pretty close. It's pretty close because it, it has this album has all the stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. And I think probably, oh, God, is the bargaining. And you yeah. start there and um, it's 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 it was it was her. And she talks about it on the liner notes, yeah. how um, personal this was. And and I think. People talk about it. her, her albums, her songs have always been personal in a way. They've been little pieces of personal. And then, and I think Clem often talks about this with me about his poetry. You know, there's a little bit of nugget in it that may be a personal piece, but then it stretches out from that. It's not exactly every time. And I think that's her songwriting. But I that's think perfect. when you go back to Bear, it is her most personal album by any stretch of the imagination and you see it in a lot of these songs 
or conversations, literally conversations with herself. Uh, we'll talk about that, I'm sure, with Honestly and different and other songs. They're conversations with herself. <laughs> so it's it's incredible. But Clem, what do you want to say? <laughs> Oh my gosh, you guys are so funny. I'm getting so excited even thinking about it. I want to I want to play it. Um, for me, Bear is um, it's my favorite Annie Lennox solo album. Um, I have to go all the way back to I think about for me, it, it's such a great exploration of this disintegration of a relationship and and uh, a relationship that has has endured for probably at this point i'm thinking by the time the album is released it's been 15 years since we first see the gorgeous back of yuri's head in the video for you place to chill in my heart in 1988 so it's been 15 years since we meet this gorgeous man out in the desert that she's all wrapped up with right so she's had three children of course we know the stillbirth of the son uh, she's been through that with him. She's now had the, the two children um, with, with, um, with Lola and Tally, um, lost Daniel. So the, the amazing span of time with this man, and then to have all of that fall apart. And she's, she's left with, what, a 10 and a 12-year-old, I think. Um, I, I love her for so many reasons. But for, for the first thing about Bear that I loved is, is when she describes herself as a mature artist facing up to loss facing up to things that have gone wrong and you know i think we all like to think when you're an annie lennox or when you're a dave stewart or when you're a whatever someone who is who has made it in the industry like they have made it and and have this legendary status attached to their name i think we like to think that they, they don't have bad days well of course they have bad days of course they have things go horribly wrong and this went horribly wrong for her and her relationship and she turns it into what is for me, by the time we get to the end, it's such a cathartic thing here because it's 11 tracks. Uh, we open with this idea, though, and Rex, by the way, you know, I, I publicly apologize to you, my friend. I got it wrong. I thought it was um, uh, Wilkie. Is his name Daniel Wilkie? Is that his name you guys had on the podcast? Is that like, am I getting his name right? Neil. 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 <laughs> sorry if you're listening. Who Daniel is? Um, somebody. Neil. Daniel. You. Um, I, I got it wrong. I thought he was listening to it backwards, but but it was Rex listening to it backwards. Rex, I will tell you that is the playlist that I have now. That's how I listen to Bear is backwards because of you. Um, and I've added wow. my three favorite remixes and the radio edit, uh, which cuts out all that gorgeous vocalizations that Annie's doing at the beginning. But is it a little superfluous at the beginning? Eh, if you've heard it 58,000 times, like we have, maybe. So I go for the radio edit at the end of the album just to remind the audience of what it may have heard and what you may have sounded like without that. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I, you go through all the stages with her. I'm glad you mentioned that, Mark. But I just think it's such a brilliant look at the disintegration of a relationship. And I don't know that, um, honestly, I don't know that someone has captured it any better than she did in 2003. Um, and, you know, I think we're, we're all sitting here talking about, you know, this is her breakup album and, you know, her breakup with Yuri and all that. And she said publicly, this is not a divorce album. This is not a this is not a breakup album. <laughs> but yet we're all treating it as such because that is really the theme of it. So, you know. Maybe it's a it's a big soup and part of what happened with Yuri is in there and the rest is maybe uh, other things, other experiences, or it could be completely directly what it is. And, you know, she's not going to give all her cards away. So, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of I know, Rex, we, we, we've heard that and we've seen in so we've read things about that. I think that is uh, I think she's doing the same thing we all do, because, again, just being human, I think it's, she's protecting herself. Um, there's so much pain and so much hurt, I think, involved in it. There would have to be. So I, I think that, you know, when people were talking about my poetry and people ask me that, that happens sometimes publicly. People say, oh, so this is about you and whatever. And I'm like, no, not really. But of course, there are pieces and parts there. So I think that's right. what she's doing. She's a lot of that's, yeah, it's interesting what you said about her protecting herself, because if she were to come out and say, yes, this is my divorce album, can you imagine what it would be like in an interview? So, Annie, it, did he really do what he did in this song right here? And, you know, that kind of thing. And <laughs> she'd be like. So. But I kind of think sometimes because let's 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 talk about this for a second. 
uh, I was on mute. <laughs> uh, Bear was not an incredibly successful album. It was successful, but it it wasn't like Medusa. It wasn't like Diva. Um, and of course, it had been what eight years since Medusa. So I mean, uh, there was peace in between it. So there was Eurythmics in between it. I've always wondered if um, if she she she's such an artist. So I think she wants her songs, and I get this to speak for her. To but if she had talked about how painful this was and why it was painful, if she would have connected with people. Now, having said that, we lived in a very different time twenty years ago. Today, if you release this album and the way social media is today, wow, it it would it may be the exact thing that everyone would be doing and talking about and and uh, talking about it on different podcasts for that matter. You know, there, there may not be a music podcast, but they may be talking about divorce and you know, well, you know, Annie Lennox's album. So we lived in a very different world then. We didn't necessarily come out and talk about our pain quite as much as maybe we would now because we're we post everything about our lives on social media we all do it maybe we shouldn't do it but there you go so i always wondered you know i could see you know this this tour uh, talking to different media people and talking about and she wasn't going to do that uh so was it about her divorce uh, it, it, it's clearly there um, like Clem said, you know, maybe it's still bits and pieces, but to me, it's still as personal as she's ever been since before or since. Uh, and maybe that makes sense because that probably was, uh, you know, just from the outside looking in the, the, the most painful time of her life, it, it would have had to have been, I mean, it, she hadn't experienced that kind of thing, uh, so, and I can't imagine, and I, I don't want to imagine, but. I, I think it's interesting, Mark, that you refer to it as, as maybe not that successful. And here I am thinking, if, if we go by charts, it's her most successful album. Uh, nearly a million copies sold in its first uh, year between 2003 and 2004. Um, there are no singles, no official singles from J Records, the Aresis subsidiary. I think it's an incredibly successful album. I think it's personally a successful album. It's nominated for Best Pop Album of the Year. Um, I, I think it's hugely successful. Um, probably more successful than she even thought it would be, I think, because we're also looking at an artist we all know. I'm so sick of ageism, you guys. I, I just want to scream. She was over, she's what, 49, 50 years old when this comes out. So Clear Channel uh, all over the U.S., you know, thank God for independent radio. Thank God for NPR radio. Uh, thank God for public broadcasting, because that's how I got to experience Bear in my hometown here in Lexington on 91.3 FM. They were playing Pavement Cracks. They were playing uh, A Thousand Beautiful Things. They were playing Honestly. They were playing Loneliness, Wonderful um and and it even they even kept playing it when she started touring with sting so so for me i saw it as incredibly successful that's interesting though that you look at it as kind of like eh, it almost sold a million copies though you think still not well i don't i don't mean that it, it but if you compare it to diva and medusa that sold multiple millions of copies in the u.s alone uh but what you said just a second ago uh she said in the liner notes that she that she wanted to um, uh, the image on the front to sort of expose herself, and that she didn't want to have some airbrushed image. That she that and again, I go back to that, and it it, it is it's 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 that um, artist. She wants to present it this way. She wants to present the music this way. She wants to present the cover this way, and she wants you as the listener to get out of it what you get out of it. Uh, so when I say successful, I just meant compared to Diva and Medusa, which is inevitable anyway, you know, the span of time with pop artists that she and Dave really are still being listened to 40 years later of Sweet Dreams. It's, it's, it's an incredible feat. Most people don't get that. They get a couple of albums and they're gone. Yeah. That's the incredible. Yeah. But uh, 
Rex, did you did you want to well, say no, something? I, um, it's really interesting that that Bear got so much airplay in Lexington, and all those different songs as well. Here in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is a you know a pretty big music market, we heard Pavement Cracks very rarely on like the album radio station. I heard it once or twice, and that was it. They didn't even, they didn't even when Sting and Annie Lennox came around on tour. They didn't even review it in the local paper. So yeah, and 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 we're this is the San Francisco Bay Area where she has a huge fan base. I don't understand. I don't understand it. You would think that. You know, when I moved here in 86, heard tons of Eurythmics on the radio and tons of uh, her solo stuff deep from Diva. But then with M Medusa and ever since then, not so much. And it's really kind of funny because this is a big market here. And I would think a big market. Go ahead, Mark. No, no, I, I just I started to say I would think that would be a big market for her, the San Francisco area. I would just expect to hear more airplay than I than I actually hear here. I mean, um, the pop stations played No More I Love You's, only the pop stations. The, uh, you know, the, uh, the AOR stations or whatever didn't touch it. They would play Train in Vain a little bit, but sparingly, you know. Um, they didn't touch a wider shade of pale at all, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is it's always, it's always baffled me that I live in this market here and, and I, and I don't, I don't hear her more, you know, especially since she has a huge fan base here. Well, Rex, something I've, you and I have talked about recently, there's, there's a change in attitude about Annie Lennox lately. Go to any YouTube or any article maybe that's, that has comments there's such a change that's happened with her and the public. She is so revered. She has become kind of that icon uh, of music. And that's a fairly new thing. A few years back, you would have had a lot of detractors like, oh, I can't stand the way she looks or I don't like her. It's, it's comment after comment after comment now of just uh, that she has earned this place in music history where there's a lot of respect for her. So I think it's it's been this kind of strange up and down, you know, is she a cult artist? Is she a pop artist? You know, and he had that with Eurythmics. It's just, it's just, and I think as Clem kind of points out, it's interesting, he's in Kentucky and he heard Bear on the, I heard Pavement Cracks once on the radio, once. Uh, and so, um, I think it's the market. It's the person who's running your market. It's the person who's, you know, deciding what's going to be on that radio's uh, playlist. And thankfully, hey, the folks in Kentucky got a really great deal there with the radio. <laughs> Which I we, we have a really, um, yeah, we have a, a supportive, of course, this was 20, 20 years ago, but um, our local NPR um, there's several, but the, the main one in Lexington for 91.3 is so supportive of um, mature artists. It's a triple A station. Um, so they are really creating playlists that a lot of, lot of deep album cuts, uh, but they'll also throw in the occasional song that you also may hear on a commercial radio station. But, but yeah, I, I'm very, very fortunate. We're very fortunate in Lexington in the area. I think we have some good stations. And um, yeah, very lucky to get to hear a lot of bear. And it wasn't me calling asking for it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that, you know, honestly, guys, I don't know that I've ever called a radio station and asked them to play anything. I don't, that's just not who I am. Uh, so I'll, I don't remember I'll, ever calling him. I'll just tell a, a quick <laughs> funny story play, about like, that. Please play. I was listening to the, it was, this was back in the early 90s. And I was listening to the radio and it was the alternative station from San Francisco. And I thought, I'm just going to call up and, and request some Eurythmics. I didn't know what was going on on the radio at the time, what they were doing. I just thought, I'm going to call them. Well, apparently I called right in the middle of them asking people to, to call in with their answers to some kind of a survey, you know. So the, the, late, the DJ comes on and she's like, yeah, and, and uh, Sarah called and, and she's definitely in favor of that. And um, Rick called and he's not in favor. of. And then this guy Rex called and all he wanted to do was hear a Eurythmics song. <laughs> So I was sort of humiliated, but yet kind of like, you know, at least I got that word out there, right? Eurythmics. But um, yeah. 
I think I forgot what I was originally going to say now. So somebody that, else can that's talk. That's hilarious. That's that, that. I love that. that uh, do you do remember back in the day when you call your radio station up and like, hey, can you play? Yeah, that's not. You don't do that with uh, serious radio anymore. They just play Imagine Dragons eighteen thousand times a day. Drives me crazy. But anyway, rem- let's I let's remember- talk. About- no, this is real. Quick. I remember oh, what I was going to say there was a little teeny radio station from Napa, California. Very progressive. Sounds a lot like Clem, what what you have there. And they were even playing like Dave Stewart's solo songs. They played Jealousy, and uh, they played My My Baby's Gonna Cry, and they played the remix of My My Baby's Gonna Cry. So I just was so impressed by that that I called up the radio station and just you know I think I just gushed to the guy how grateful I was that that he was playing this stuff. Oh. I think that's great. Well, let, let's, let's talk about beer. Let's let's take it step by step or track by track, rather, the way Annie presented it, not Rex's going backward look. We won't do that. We won't go backward. But if you've not done that, I'm telling you, try it. If, it's, if it's Annie chooses hard. to release it backwards, I want it to be called Bear, the Rex Aldana version. <laughs> if, if Annie's listen, if Annie's ever if Annie ever hears this, she's going to be like, "Yeah, right." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I just called it bear backwards, but I do like the Rex Feldana version. I like that. We could call it bear back. Oh yes, there you go. <laughs> I'm muted, so people can't hear me laughing. But I'm mo- I'm moving this conversation on. <laughs> all right a thousand beautiful things who wants to talk about a thousand beautiful I, I think it's a great song i love that song i think we I should yeah. let clem talk about it I, I think for a thousand beautiful things thanks for I, I think it um it's one of those that it, it had to it was sort of a um um bit of a dark horse for me in, on this album in the beginning when I first started listening to it I wasn't quite sure um, it probably took three listens for me to really sort of get into the rhythm of what she was doing and sort of this listing of things and and then it I was first taken by the language that she was using and and when she when she asks to be lit up like the sun what so I, I stopped and I played it over and then you fall deeply, troublingly in love with the song. And then, as I told Mark before, I'm really not happy, and I love dance music, but I'm really not happy when this gorgeous, almost what feels religious in some ways to me, um, gets these remixes. And admittedly, I absolutely love some of them, but I never, I, you know, for me, the banger is coming up. The banger is bitter pill. Um, second banger is probably erased with that, that incredible tribal beat we get. But anyway, um, honestly, even that was the AC single that probably could have been a top 10 hit. Hello, J records. Anyway, um, I, I love what she's doing. I love listing all of this. And now like we were talking about the backwards idea, it, it makes even more sense for me, but I, I, I'm glad we're taking it this way. Uh, it's a gorgeous piece. Her vocals on it are amazing. The lyrics are amazing. Um, you, you fall right into what you know. I say this all the time. Annie Lennox, to me, means quality music. And I know I'm going to get something that is beautifully produced. I know I'm going to get something that's beautifully written and performed. And she never disappoints me, regardless of what it is, even if it's Christmas. Exactly. Right. I agree with that. Yeah. 100%. And it, it 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 backward or forward. It's 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 a great great opening. It can be a great conclusion if you want to do it the flip way, but it it's a very hopeful song, in in a very distressing, depressing time, that just remember. You can remember all the good things. You know there are good things happening in your life, or hopefully, uh, and so it is a beautiful thing. Thank you for you know. She she lists you know what she's thankful for, and I think that's it's it's a beautiful, you know, and it it was it uh, it wasn't a single here necessarily. I think it was single, mm-hmm. but, um, or actually I don't think that, it happened um... in the UK even. It was a very strange thing. Out the videos didn't come out. Um, I think quite frankly, let's just go back a minute. I think this was a very difficult time for her, <laughs> and and it shows in kind of 
the way the singles were or were not done. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes, the videos were not or not done or pulled back or so, but um, you know, it does, it, it moves into second track is pavement cracks, which is without a doubt, you know, the most pop oriented uh, track on it. it. It's very much in line, I think, with the style of walking on broken glass in that style. So, it, um, but it it's it's one of my top Annie Lennox solo songs. It may, I'm not sure where I voted for it. And remember the poll 101? Mm -hmm. I think it may have been my top choice because I can listen to this song any time of the day, turn it up really loud. And that third opening of the third verse, uh, where is my comfort zone? A simple place uh, I can call my own. I I, I feel that. I, I, I'm, I, it's a very emotional thing for me. I, I feel that very deeply because uh, I, I, I think I'm like that. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a melancholy person sometimes. Um, and it, it it speaks to me. It's um, it, the entire song speaks to me. Um, I don't think it's the most adventurous song on the album. You know what I mean? Uh, in the sense of breaking uh, down barriers and how you might do a song, because uh, she she's does that here with a lot of different styles. But so I think it's very much a pop song. But it speaks to me uh, so very much, and I love it. Uh, uh, immense. I agree. It's a great song. Um, I wish it would have been a bigger hit, but when the first time I heard it, I thought this is a great song, but I can't see this getting a lot of airplay because it's complicated. It's long. Uh, it's it has a slow build, you know. And it's like all her. It's like all her best songs. They have that slow build and it just builds and builds and then explodes, you know. Um, it's a beautiful song. Oh, that, you that know? Goes back I heard it on the radio so twice, I think, and that was it. <laughs> But it does. It does. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's good that you mentioned, Mark, that you talked about Diva, because I think of, of all the songs on Bear, I think Pavement Cracks is the most Diva-esque um, that may have still worked in on Diva um, 21 years before we get this album. Um, Pavement Cracks for me was... It, it, it's one of those... Um, I started to say like this epiphany goes off that you realize what an amazing record it is, that this amazing song. Um, and it does sort of happen for you because of that slow build. Um, so she really lets you sort of get into this place of where she is. I always picture her uh, that it's like six o'clock in the morning, which we know we're going back to your rhythmics where it's six o'clock in the morning. Um, and I sort of get that feeling too with Pavement Cracks that she's been walking all night um, in my mind, uh, she left this, uh, there was supposed to be the Toronto show. Um, and in my mind, you know, when you play these songs, we've got no video. So I sort of played this idea that things didn't go well at the Toronto show, that, that lost show that we don't, we've never seen, uh, where she debuts Bear, right? And, uh, or songs from Bear. And we've never seen that, 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 or at least I haven't. You guys may have seen a copy of it. I, I haven't. Um, but anyway, I sort of pictured her walking the streets and, and she's just singing to herself at, at six o'clock in the morning, sun's coming up and she starts singing the song, which almost starts like a tone. It has this very sort of when she starts vocalizing and then you realize, wow, she's really going to go there with the vocals and she does. And it's this gorgeous ending and I, she totally sells it for me. I still like the single edit, the radio edit the best. Uh, when she cuts it down to four minutes and something. We're coming up to something that needs to be cut down. The, uh, the What is it called? The Hurting Time. The Hurting Time is your next track. Please, please, somebody, cut two minutes off that. Cut two minutes off that and you call. Yeah, you know, I I go back and forth with The Hurting Time. Sometimes I can listen to the whole thing and, I, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm with it. Other times it's like, yeah, it's too long. But to me, it's so rem reminiscent of these like early 70s, like R&B singers like uh, Brooke Benton. Absolutely. There's Rainy Night in Georgia. If you've ever heard that song, it reminds me of that kind of thing. Um, slow and melancholy and 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 just. Um, but 
soulful and there's definitely an r&b thing going on there and and but yes and I, I struggle i struggle with the length of it <laughs> don't like the r&b vibe on it at all i love the lyrics i love her vocals i don't like the r&b vibe that's going on i don't like the background music and there's some like instrument that, that recorder or whatever that is that order whatever it is it and and steven lipson likes to use that a lot and it's like nails on a chalkboard with me it and, and everybody knows because i've talked about this before but uh, uh it's um uh, uh what's the one called the uh, greatest hits uh, uh was it just another love affair it reminds me of that song which is as everybody knows but i mean it it I don't want to dis. I don't want to dis to diminish to diminish it, but I, I I agree with Clem. It goes on too long, um, and um, uh, but I will say, you know, I, I come back and discover songs that I didn't like uh, years later, and sometimes I, I can. But I will say, of the eleven tracks here, the hurting time is my least favorite. I'll have to say that. Well, something that you guys have kind of danced around here. Um, if, if you're familiar with with Philly soul, with with Philadelphia soul, that's so much of what we're hearing on Bear. It's all over it. Um, it it has this this heavy orchestral uh, stuff going on, strings, um, a lot of repetition. Um, you hear it later. Uh, there's funk. There's jazz. There's little. Uh, touches of disco. I don't even know if Annie was intentionally doing her sort of 70s Philly soul album, but whether she was intentionally doing it or not, she did it with Bear, uh, with songs like The Hurting Time and Wonderful. Um, of course, we know Loneliness, we'll talk about in a little bit, is, is the arena rocker on this collection that, that's so well done, totally sells it. But the hurting time, uh, there is this little touch of, um, and I hate to say this because, but there's a little touch of, I mentioned jazz, there's a little touch of maybe elevator jazz happening um, a little bit in the hurting time. I think it gets, and, and, and we mentioned Stephen Lipson. Um, there is, the, there's the, the legend around, the urban legend around, right? There's, a, there's an earlier version of Bear. Is that right? That we haven't talked about? I've always heard that that she brought in Stephen Lipson, who'd done Medusa and Diva, to kind of tweak it a little bit. I don't know if that that's just I, I have a memory. Actually, Rex and I were talking about that earlier. He does not have that memory, but I have a memory of reading something about that. I could be wrong. Uh, hey, I'm a little bit older today, so um, yeah, I, it could have been. Uh, I could just be. I could be. Uh, mixing that up with something but I, I do want to say real quick that Stephen Lipson I've talked about this on another podcast I think but Stephen Lipson said before this came out that he said this is Annie Lennox's career defining album now again it didn't turn out to be that but I think probably what he was talking about was how personal it was and how it was going to connect to people again I know Clem wants to talk about how it, he just found it to be a very successful, but it, it wasn't in the sense of a diva. It wasn't her career defining album. Uh, it didn't do that to the public at the time. Right. I think it's still possible that it could, if people could rediscover it. Let's remember, Bear was not released in on vinyl because it wasn't being done at that point. Things had changed. I'd love to see it released on vinyl. Uh, I think we all would. Um, it could be rediscovered, but um, yeah, I think I think you're right. I think that's interesting about the Philly soul kind of thing. Uh, and if we go from Rex's backward sense of, or or the forward, you know, you have a, some a positive, and it, it's moving into this darkness where it's the hurting time. But the music belies that. It's very eurythmics in that that you know the hurting time, but the music. You know, the music is not depressed. I would have loved to have seen it actually, uh, this song that would have made me weep by the end of it. It's not going to do that with its delivery the way it is. You know, it's uh, so the hurting time. Well, but 
Clem, you said, you mentioned it has elements of ele elevator jazz in it. And if you think about, if we, if we look at it in reverse and it's placed almost towards the end, uh, you would think, why would a, a song about despair be so close to the end? I kind of take it as kind of like, she's not talking about I'm hurting right now. She's talking about the concept of hurting, the hurting time. And she may be over it right now or recovered from it. And now she's kind of just examining it and looking at it. And maybe that's where that kind of, um, I don't want to say light or fluffy stuff, but that elevator jazz, maybe that's where that comes in. Maybe it's meant to sort of convey something that this is not as serious as, as, as I'm, as, as you think it is. I'm, I'm looking more, I'm looking at this more objectively. Does that make sense? That, that does make sense. <laughs> It does, it does too, and I get a little bit of a, every time I listen to that song, um, which I do listen to it all the way through, uh, all the time, even though I say two minutes, two minutes edited off of this, it really would have helped it, but I get a Herbie Hancock feel with The Hurting Time. Um, is it around this same time that she does Hush, is it called Hush, 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 with, with Herbie Hancock? I, I get a feeling that maybe there's a little bit of overlap there with what Herbie Hancock does and what the hurting time is trying to do. Um, you That's know, one, so at point. the end of the day, if, if I get to hear Annie Lennox sing for seven minutes and 32 seconds, I don't care. I know. I don't, right? care, that there's a, I don't <laughs> care that there's a little bit of, of maybe a jazz theme or sound that I've heard a thousand times. I don't really care. Hearing her, it's a gorgeous vocal gorgeous vocal um and to me it slides into what is really probably the moment on the album mark touched on this i think rex maybe you did too the next track honestly is when she and honestly is when she for me this all comes together there's so many annies and they're all talking in their head about how this went right and, and honestly, kind of harkens back a little bit. Again, Wonderful will do this too. They harken back to the Annie that was wrong about that other person. She, she says it in why. You know, let's go down to the water's edge and, and keep my big mouth shut. And, and, mm -hmm. and the same thing starts happening. And honestly, the same thing is, certainly happens in Wonderful. Um, it's, again, this idea that I've been so wrong for so long and and we get that from her and i also love you guys mentioned about this and it's something i will never tire of with your rhythmics and with annie lennox that juxtaposition of she mentions it of course we know she didn't write no more i love you but of course the lover speaks but that buttonhole tune that little honey tune that you can keep in your head and we get a lot of those juxtaposed against crushingly melancholic lyrics and i love that I love her for that. I think nobody does it better. And I think she never did it better than she does on Bear. All right, I'm going to shut up. We're going to talk about Honestly, right? Well, about, I, so, I won't shut up. about Honestly, can you guys remember of uh, a big hit pop song from the late 80s where it featured the same kind of thing as Honestly with somebody singing and talking in the background at the same time? I'll give you 10 seconds. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Oh. Do you remember To Pow, Heart and Soul? Of course, of course, of course, yeah. When I heard Honestly for the first time, I thought, this reminds me of To Pow, not the way it's, not the music, but the concept of the talking and the singing at the same time. Yeah, I get that. So, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, you know. And um, I, I like what you said a minute ago, uh, Clem, uh, that about when that she's talking about when she was wrong. And so it's 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 the two things when she was wronged, wrong ed wronged, and also when she was wrong. You're very much you're very right on that. Now that's very interesting. I hadn't thought about that, but she's talking about those two different Absolutely. things. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I'm so glad. I, I I love it again, guys. I'm going to brag on you. I love how you do these because it's just like friends hanging out talking about music. Well, and this that's what we, I'm going to have another, another we would, Mark and I would sit around talking. And I think one day we just finally said, why don't we just do podcasts of us? Just we're, we were, <laughs> apparently we were so taken with our own conversations, Mark, right? That 
<laughs> that we thought everybody has to hear this. <laughs> and frank, frankly, we weren't sure if anybody was going to be interested, but you know, seems that they are. Little did you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing that, uh, yeah, it, it has been. Good. Um, so did we want to say more about honestly, or did we want to move on to wonderful? I did want to mention that in, you know, she did the solo tour and yeah. the early stages of that tour, she performed honestly live and she was under the stage was with these huge, uh, big light bulbs. They were to made to look like, you know, the light bulb that you screw in. Yeah. And it was a beautiful part on the stage. I don't generally people will get rid of a song in a concert if they don't think the audience it's it's connecting enough. Uh, so, uh, but I remember it so distinctly. I saw her on the second show of the tour and the third show of the tour, and I remember it so distinctly. And uh, it's a pity it wasn't it wasn't ever captured on video uh, because it was so great. Uh, and uh, but just that those conversations to me. I don't know, maybe Tapao did a little bit. I don't know that anyone's ever really done this like she did it. I think this is one of those times where this is something new. This is something different than anyone's ever done. These conversations that's going on. And you really you, you really need the lyric sheet to say, what, what, did, what did she say? What is she saying? Because you get a little bit of it. But there was man, also a little that's bit of a that in, oh, wait a minute. Oh. Uh, Oh, I'm 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 not muted. There's a, there's a little bit of that in Beethoven as well with the talking and the singing and you know. Annie Lennox has a lot of conversations with herself right. in her songs. <laughs> I think that's. Well, this. So, this is this is all reminding me of. Um, have you ever had anyone tell you that you you ask all the best questions because you are going to provide the answers? So I, I think in a lot of ways, or you have the best seat in the house because you're not looking at you know, yourself. And and I think sometimes, maybe for Annie, I, I think this album, she does, I, I think she, she does give us the answer that at the end, when she turns to a higher power, um, she's, she's been through it all in these other 10 tracks. So she just turns it over. You know, it's like when someone says your spiritual friends who say they're just going to turn it over to God or they're going to turn it over to the Lord or they're whatever. And I think we all do come to a point where even if we're someone who isn't terribly religious, like I'm not terribly religious, but at the same time, I think you do get to a point and, and you just sort of turn it over and you 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 can't answer anymore. Uh, maybe you can't even ask the question anymore, but I think sometimes that's, that's um, a place we all get to. And I think she got there probably with this. I think she did it beautifully. Yeah, and she turned it over to somebody else at the end, the big guy, that, right? And that's a great point for making the case of listening to it the right way, you know, because that that is a way to interpret an ending as well. I mean, I'm just going to hand it over to God. I'm going to let God take care of it. I, I was looking at it more like, you know, like, oh, my God, I'm in such despair. Oh, God, help me, you know, but um, and it can go that way, too. But but that's the beauty of art, right? You can interpret it so many different ways. And I'm sure artists listen to people like us talk and they go, wow, um, I didn't even think of it that way, you know? So the listener or the viewer can sometimes get things that the artist doesn't even, doesn't even realize, you know? Well, I'm uh, sure people are reading your poetry, Clem, and, and reading between the lines and, you know, getting something. And they might like, well, you said you had somebody say to you, well, this must be about that. And you're like, well, no, not really. It's not, but. The fact that somebody can get that out of it. And I think it's, I, I think a lot of it, Rex, and is, is, I think people want to, especially now, I think more than ever, that we all live in this social media world. And Mark was talking about this a little bit about 20 years ago. Maybe it wasn't quite like this, but now people want to know everything they, you know like maybe you're online and, and someone is they pop up and they're like oh i saw you on facebook and i started talking to you or whatever i think it's i think we want to know more about people maybe than ever before and um i think we all just sort of accept it that once we put this out there we put ourselves out there that we open ourselves up to that um and and i think this whole this whole idea of um i mentioned this i use a word called ephemeral meaning uh, of something of, of a very it has a short nature to it or it's not going to last very long or it's 
going to poof, you know, and it's away. And I think we're living in something like that. That's what's so nice about a, a legend or a legacy artist, if you will, like Annie Lennox. Um, this is going to live forever, what she's doing. And people like the three of us right now are going to be talking about her 100 years from now, I think, just like we're doing. Um, because there's, there's this catalog of music that you simply can't, it, it, it's, it's, once you've listened to it, it's, it's in you. It's unavoidable. It, it totally makes sense to me when you go back and look at it that I always feel so good about this. And I tell people this. I feel so good that I loved them at the beginning. Well, maybe not 1981. I feel so good that I loved them from 83 um, when, I, when I truly fell in love. And, and I've been there ever since because um, you understand that you are listening to quality musicians and people who, um, who really care about their craft and who are doing it so well. Well, I think I don't we, even hit, know where we, we hit it right on the head. Earlier, you just hit it right on the head when you said we're always going to get quality, quality music, quality vocals, quality production. I mean, and I guess a lot of artists might say, well, you know, that's what I do too. But there's a commitment there, a level of commitment. You know, I mean, it's always, it's always the high bar or nothing. You know, and and that's the way it should be. You know. So, anyway, should we move on to wonderful? Um, yeah, I, I think like that's. The middle of the album so it, it, that has a, a very wonderful and bitter pill so rex go ahead yeah wonderful is is <laughs> well i mean i think have, haven't we all been through this where you've broken up with somebody but hey you know um yeah we're broken up and this relationship isn't working out but hey just come on over and uh you know we'll have a little fun for a while i mean what is it post breakup sex you know wasn't there a song called post breakup sex or something like that that's what it that's what that song is about it's about it's about you you're no longer with this person but you're not quite ready to be with another person yet i'm just going to say it and you're horny and you and you, maybe you you you're you're you want some sex and love and you're going to do it with this person because it's familiar and you know them and that's the way it is you know that's what i get out of that i never know what rex is going to say I think that's the beautiful thing about this podcast. I never know where he's going. <laughs> it's a song about post breakup sex with the person you've broken up with. I I, I love it. I I absolutely love it. I, I know people can't see me, but I am cackling on the other end. Um, I have never Rex in my life thought wonderful was about about uh, um, sex after. I love that now. Uh, you know what I've always thought. I, I thought she was, uh, we talked about this earlier, about the answer. I thought she was lying to herself, feeling wonderful, that she felt anything but wonderful. Um, so I thought this was all this sort of grand um, telling myself, I've already, I've got 12 of me telling me th this and honestly, and I thought wonderful was, yet she's brought along another couple of girlfriends living in her head. Who are who are trying to bump her up, um, but it's still not there. Uh, so I'm just going to lie about it all. Wonderful has this swoon sort of quality to it that you fall into that rhythm and you are just lost and you are amazed at what she's doing with her voice and where it's going and this give and take and and it's I, to me when I heard wonderful I thought this this is this is huge. This is so totally Philadelphia soul. This is Hall and Oates. This is Annie Lennox doing Daryl Hall. Um, yeah, they were expecting big things from it, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I, it's probably a song, honestly, uh, between listening to the, the remix, the new mix show, um, Dave, I think, is it Ade? I, I, do, I don't know if you pronounce oh, it. Ade Auto, yeah, Auto Ade, sure. yeah. 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 I think that for me, listening to the the new uh, new romantic mix show and the regular tracks, those are the two that I probably listen to more from Bear than any other song from Bear. Uh, but I do listen quite frequently. If you look at my iTunes, that I listen to Bear more than anything else from any Linux um, Well, but, just to, but... just just to back up my my thoughts about this being a song about. <laughs> I'll just read some of the the lyrics. And these are the lyrics that made me think that. I want to have you because you're all I've got. Okay. Um, 
Let's see. <laughs> sad. Um, so sad. Don't want to need you, but it's where I'm at. You know. Right. Um, right. It just. Oh, it's just that's just them. that's just part of a breakup. You know, that's just part of a breakup. I'm not saying that everybody has goes and has post breakup sex with their ex, but it's a thing. You know. And, I kind of hope they do. Now that you've <laughs> mentioned it. <laughs> I, I, think, I think I think that it it, it it is definitely about what you are saying, but I think for me there's some there's a part in there that addresses that that addresses that um, you know I'm really mad at you and we've broken up and you've done me wrong, but I'm still attracted to you and and right right uh, you, you, I, I want to have you because you're all I've got you know maybe I'm Which I, I love maybe the lyrics of this. I, I love the idea. There's somewhere out there. There's a there's a review of this that talks about this song is going to be played in every bedroom late at night, post breakup at two a.m. or something like that. And I thought, yes, that that nailed it. That's exactly right. This is the feeling. Again, it goes back to what we've been talking about. She has Annie Lennox has a way of touching us. Um, because it's so real, because I think she understands what it means to be human. And I think a lot of her maybe, maybe staying away, maybe not being so involved in what we think of as pop culture, uh, this kind of lifestyle uh, that we hear, of course, in shame that she and Dave are both shaming, um, I, I, and that she has really sort of stayed away from. And I think maybe that has helped her be more uh, empathetic, maybe. Uh, understanding the human condition better. I think she could have maybe been a brilliant psychologist had she not choose, uh, chosen to be a brilliant senior songwriter. Um, she understands the human condition, but for this, for me, this is this is an Annie Lennox who is lying to herself. But I, I hope I hope there's some sex in it, Rex. I do. Uh, well, and, and I hope there's that's I and mean, that's part of it too. The lying to yourself is part of that. It's just all part of the tapestry, I think. You know. Um, I don't know what that says about me, that that's what I got out of it. Well, then maybe we do know what it says about me, huh? Oh, well. It's a, it's a fairly deep conversation about that. I mean, and that's, <laughs> so let's, uh, I, I do, I want to say, I do agree with uh, Clem, the new romantic remix. Man, that is good. The wonderful remix. Uh, Bitter Pills, the next track, which I thought from the first time I heard it in the concert, I thought that's going to be a single. Of course, it wasn't a single. Never got a remix. Never really got you know anything beyond that it was performed in the concerts. Um, and I, I guess it, it, it. You could also say I did. I said a minute ago that Pavement Cracks was probably the most pop thing. I think Bitter Pills, a fairly pop song, right smack dab in the middle of of the album uh, it's a great loss it, it's 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 the um uh the next generation's version of thorn in my side she's mm. you know she's not leaving anything on uh, off the table here it's thorn in my side and bitter pill this is who you are to me i'm having a hard time swallowing this i don't is think it, it's is this the song that had the uh the beginning that paid that paid homage to was it alicia keys or mary j blige and she even said so. She said, and if you go and listen to the to the to the Mary J. Blige or Alicia Keys song, it's the beginning. It's got dun 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 dun. You know that kind of thing. Um, and I forget which artist it is. I think it's Mary J. Blige, but I could be wrong. Um, and I went and listened to it at the time, and I was like, oh yeah, I, I can see that. So it's sort of a little homage that she did. But it's a brilliant song, and and I love all the little the little uh, ding, the little bell, the little. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which she does a lot on that album, actually. And uh, you hear that in a lot of uh, 70s soul music, too. Uh, those the those little those little symbols or bells or whatever they call them. Yeah, back, back to one of them. Yeah, it's, um, I, I, I feel like Bitter Pill has uh, definitely a, an homage to, to a little bit of a 70s disco kind of feel, but it's also very modern. Um, once, you know, four years later, when we get Songs of Mass Destruction, we get Colored Bedspread, which is the seventh track, I think, on Songs of Mass Destruction. And on here, Bitter Pills, the sixth track. I love when they're sequencing this and they're like, okay, let's give them a little bit of a synthesizer heaven kind of rush here. And that's how this feels too. Uh, because she knows her audience. She knows who we are. 
and she knows what we're going to want to hear after a little while. And so we want a banger and bitter pill is definitely the banger on bear. I couldn't believe it. I still can't believe it. I'm still a little, still a little myth. I wanted remixes. I wanted like 10 remixes of bitter pill. You know, you've taken this gorgeous, gorgeous, drippingly beautiful song, a thousand beautiful things, and you've remixed the hell out of it. Somebody did it. Peter Rothauer or something gives us a 10 minute version of it. Um, uh, which does go dark and I love it, but I'm like, and you're ignoring bitter pill. How is that possible? But anyway, that's okay. Gabriel and Dresden does the same thing with it. How did you ignore bitter pill? How did you ignore erase? Oh my God. But eh, I'll shut up. See, well, I when all the songs are so about. good. You could say that about almost any of them, huh? Okay. <laughs> hey, instead of, instead of taking the album backward, I think it would have been a great album to remix. A whole thing of remix that oh. you can get all the well we I mean, need, all, we need vinyl. all the songs the remix were number one dance hits so there was there maybe maybe arista or j records whatever it was at the time and rca or whoever they were they were missing out on you know like okay maybe the whole thing should be a remix forget touch dance all those years ago bear remixed is well we thing. need definitely bear on vinyl um and, and white glad. vinyl Oh, definitely. I'm glad to hear you guys say that. I'm always curious about this because I don't know. I, and I feel like you all know a lot better about this than I would. Did, did, did Annie say Thousand Beautiful Things, Pavement Cracks, and Wonderful? If you're, those are the three tracks that, that I feel are the strongest, and those are the tracks that I'm, I'm down with you remixing? Or did, was she even involved? Did she even know that these tracks were being remixed? Did any of that... I... How does that happen? I get the impression that the label probably says we'd like to remix some of the songs. And I'm sure that she um, probably has to approve that and listen to them. I know that Dave was Dave was very involved back in the 80s when people would remix Eurythmics. Like when, um, you know, there were all those acts that re remixed Eurythmics songs in the 80s. I can't think of them right now, but um, he worked with them, you know, not worked with them, but I know that he was in contact with them and so long story short, I think I think she's she's involved some probably somewhat, but not it's probably more in the like, okay, remix it, let me listen to it, and if I like it, great. If not, redo it. <laughs> or don't do it again, who knows? Right, right. Yeah, I, I I'm curious. I know what you're talking about, Rex. Uh didn't didn't Dave actually make the statement that about remixes that they'd already he'd already mixed them or or that Yes. Yeah. They, he had, these have been... Something about he had already remixed them. Um, you you kind of got the impression that maybe he wasn't happy with these other people remixing them. But then you heard mm -hmm. stories about how he would like be okay with it. So I don't know. Right. You know, right. Right. I know there was some something Mark a few years ago. Uh, some kind of thing that we saw about some conversation he had with somebody that was remixing something back in the eighties and, and he wasn't happy and then he was happy. And so. uh, well, there, there was a story about it that came out that the, the folks who were remixing, I need a man and Beethoven hmm. and they called him up. He had sent them the masters and told them do whatever you want. And then they called him up and, or something he called them up and he was very drunk and he was not happy <laughs> with, them. and they actually are some of the best remixes that's been made actually um yeah but then didn't, from a didn't, in the end he was okay with them right there was something where like he was okay with I think, they, I think they may have gotten dave at the wrong moment in the day yeah i think maybe they had a couple of too many martinis but that's all i'm saying on that because <laughs> <laughs> i'm not sure uh i think that yeah, i love it cheers to dave <laughs> right although with me it would be what is next is that a song yeah <laughs> Is it the uh, saddest song I got? Is the that saddest that? song I no lo well, we, loneliness. Although we kind of covered that. Oh, lonely. lonely. We talked about lonely. it being the arena wow. rock banger and but yeah. loneliness. I, I do. Yeah. I, I, for me, loneliness is. Um, I think it is like the the huge moment on on Bear, and it's a moment that you're not you're not quite expecting. I think. Um, when when she lets go with that and that that it's so visual again you go back to the writer the poet um the the, the idea of one hand 
uh, clapping, which one hand can't clap, obviously. Um, it, it's such a beautiful sort of release of everything that I think we've gotten in the tracks that precede it, and then you get loneliness, which for me, I don't know if you guys ever participate in those crazy little, they say, they say we shouldn't because it's what helps instill our identity, but um, I'll participate in those little questionnaires, and loneliness, loneliness is the thing for me that I, I, I fear the most with with aging is is being lonely uh god knows i don't want to talk to myself for 24 hours a day i mean i would be bananas if i did that so so i i think that it's so again it's such a real moment it's a singer songwriter who understands people i think she understands and rex you touched on this a little bit a minute ago about the sort of universal universal idea um and we get that course like in universal child uh, later on, but but this idea that it's all of humanity that sort of finds them in this place, you find yourself in a place of despair, and I think that's where loneliness gets a lot of that. I I think I, for me, loneliness is like I said, I love Pavement Cracks, and it's one of my favorite songs. Loneliness is the best song on the album. Now I know that's a, okay, well, what do you mean, Mark? You said Pavement Cracks is your favorite Annie Lane song. It is as my go-to song. Loneliness is a tour de force. Uh, it's it, it's it's lyrics that I think Joni Mitchell, you put it up with anybody, any grand uh, songwriter. Uh, just like you said, loneliness is a place that I know well. It's the distance between us and the empty inside ourselves. I mean, the lyrics, are so good. And really it goes back to what you were saying a minute ago, uh, Rex, sort of a little bit about wonderful. There's a little bit of everything in this and it's just, it, and it has such a slow build. There's such a soft opening to this song and you're not expecting where it's going and it just crashes out at the end. And uh, I've, I've, I think a lot of people get gravitate to this song when they hear it and they pay attention to it. It's a song you have to pay attention to. And she did perform it um, even on the um, tour with Steen. Um, and I think it's a slow build even in a concert. But if you're paying attention to this song and you're letting yourself take it in, um, there's nothing quite like it. It's a masterpiece in pop music, I think. I, I wish it could have been a single. I wish it could have been something that the masses heard because it's such a good song. There's, uh, I, 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 it's it's wonderful. Okay, I think you probably like it a little bit more than I do, but I still think it's a great song. <laughs> I mean, All right, the honest. saddest song I've got, and then I, 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 some people will say, "Oh, I don't think that's the saddest song." I don't think that's what she's saying. She's saying this is the saddest song I've got. This is, you know, this is tearing me down. I'm going to write about it. Uh, it uh, it has also it has it does have a remix. It's not an official remix, and uh, it's one of those that you that I really kind of like. You know, the Universal Child has a remix that's kind of like it. It takes it to a different level. You know, just kind of you know it's it's it, it's one of those things. Well, it really shouldn't be done, but oh, it's kind of interesting when you do it. But I love the saddest song I've got. It again. Hey, it's melancholy me, and yeah, I, I can I can fall into that any day of the week. You know that Re Requiem for a Private War song that she did for that film? Sort of reminded me a little bit of um, the saddest song I've got. Like it was a completely uncommercial version of, of that, you know, like same kind of, you know. And not nearly as good as the saddest song I've got, but yeah, I could see yeah. where you're going with it. Yeah, I mean, it like 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 that same vein, but way less commercial and more, more um, focused on its subject, I guess. <laughs> Liam, did you have anything you wanted to say? I, I think for me that uh, she, I think it's one of the most memorable melodies on on the album. It's one that I often will find myself, I call it um, accidentally humming when you just you start, you sort of start humming something. Sometimes I will start humming the saddest song I've got. Um, I think, Mark, I think you're right. I don't think she's trying to tell the audience. She's not trying to tell the listener. This is the saddest, saddest song I got. We all know if you've been paying attention. Annie Lennox can write a sad song. This is not the saddest one, but it's certainly, it, it's, it's, again, I think she's addressing the universal you 
And I think she's giving you the saddest song, maybe at the moment, of where she is in this situation. And that's the other thing I think is so important about as we continue to get to the end of the album. And if you, especially if you play it backwards, like Rex has talked about doing, she's going to survive this. She's going to get through this because there are all these great things. So, so it's not the saddest song. It doesn't have to be the saddest song for the moment. Uh, but it's certainly one of them. It's a, it's a song I love. I, I, I can't really think of an out, uh, the song on here I don't love, even the hurting time, even though it's two minutes too long. Yeah. Well, and it all leads into, and what I erased and twisted. Now, let me say, I think those two songs, erased and twisted, are, you have to listen to them together. They're, that you, you, they're twins to me. Now, I do know someone who doesn't like one of them. I forget which one. I think he, he doesn't like Twisted, but he loves Erased. And I never really get that because I think they're, they're, the, you have to have one of them to have the other. And I, they're such great songs. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love Erased. And again, you go back to, and she's always done this, where she's had multiple layers singing. And there's this great, there's the line, well, here, here I go remembering again all the anger and the blame. Go back and listen to that if you've not, and and how the multiple versions of layers on the blame, and that it just sticks out there for a few seconds. Blame, and it's glorious. <laughs> it's just so good. I love I love things like that when when people find little nuggets like that in songs that excite them and then share that because then I can go listen to it and. That's the best thing about songs for me is those is those those little parts that just excite you beyond belief and move your move your soul, you know. And and it could just be a five little second part of the song that just thrills you to death, you know. Not that you don't like the rest of the song, but you know. I'm going to go listen, you know, to Erase and just listen for that part. You know, I am. Um, I love everything about Erase. I think it is is probably. Um, the other night I was playing this and Ben was here uh, beside me and he was like, oh, that song. I'm like, yes, that song. That, and cause we, he was, and we started talking about it and how dark it is and this sort of this tribal drum sound. And then um, it, I think it's the most, maybe most modern um, track on Bear as far as really sounding like something that um, I, I joked, I know Twisted comes up next, but since Mark talked about them as twins, um, my comment on Twisted is, this is the song that Taylor Swift wish, wishes she had written. Um, it, it's, that's a, it's that's a very good observation. I think, yeah, I think Twisted is perfect adult pop. Mm -hmm. And to find it so deep into the album, I think that says so much about its singer and its songwriter that we're not even going to load the front of this album with this. We're going to wait right. because by the bitter end of it all, I think she realizes again, let's go back to, I was wrong. This is, this is, what does she say? Relatively twisted. So <laughs> um, she, again, she finds herself in the same situation of, of I was wrong. Yeah. I love, I love, I love that line. I'm relatively twisted. Oh my God, that yeah. is so good. It is so well, good. And, what about and those, the end of those lyrics in, um, I guess it's in Erased, you know, in, you know, you're in a fresh, clean suit, wake, um, making telephone calls in a brand, in brand new shoes. Wow. That was so like, um, like, wow, what a glimpse into like her, that was, it seems so personal, you know, I mean, like, yeah, I guess everybody, someone else's feet. Right. I, and I love that thing about sitting on someone else's couch and, and cause I mean, I, I, that's, I, I think about things like that too, you know, like I, I went through breakups where I like, damn it. Now he's probably sitting on their couch, at, you know, or, or now he's with them. And, and yeah, I mean, that's a, it's an emotion we all have, but it's so, when you put it in song like that, it seems so profound, you know, like, wow, what a revelation, but yet we all go through it and we all experience it. And that goes back to what you were saying, Mark, about how she understands the human condition, or maybe it was you, Clem, that said that, but yeah. Well, I, and I, I think something else here too is, is, is 20 years ago, we weren't hearing this from a grown ass woman. You know, a, a, a 20 year old may have been singing about some, but we weren't hearing this from a mature woman who has children, 
who is seeing the disintegration of a marriage that, that she may or may not have thought was going to last for 50 years. You know, who knows? But it, but all of it is, is, is there. I know we talked about it. She says it's not the divorce album. Well, okay. We don't have to call it the divorce album, but we do have to call it, I think, one of the great, great explorations of a disintegration of a relationship exactly. album. Exactly. Certainly, certainly for uh, the past 20 years, certainly for the 21st century. Uh, and how wonderful, how wonderful for me that, and for all of us, it should be, that it's coming from a mature person. It's not a 20 year old telling me about relationships. Who doesn't, I'm sorry, 20 year olds, if you're listening, you don't have a clue about relationships. But you talk to a 50 year old, the 50 year old has an idea about relationships. And that's what we get with this. And I absolutely love both of those. Um, I could listen to Erased and Twisted probably on repeat for, hell, I don't know, 10, 10 hours maybe until Ben like runs away. Um, <laughs> I, I would definitely do that with these guys. Love those two songs. I'm glad love that you brought up again about, you know, it's not the divorce. I kind of wanted to bookend the whole Bear discussion by saying, again, it's not her divorce album. <laughs> Even though, you know, it came after the divorce. But you, like you said, the, the examination of a disintegrating relationship. I have a question that I, I, I want to throw it out to you because I've never known how to take the line from Erased that people in glass houses shouldn't throw those stones, but something just flew through my window pane. So my question to you is, did she just throw something through the window pane or did something, somebody who was, you know, shouldn't have been throwing uh, stones in a glass house, did that come through hers? So I've never been quite sure who threw um, that through the window or whatever came I, through I kind of took it as, um, as like, yeah, you know, you shouldn't do that, but you did it anyways. Um, like somebody did it to her. But I can see what you're saying that, that it does sound kind of like maybe she did it. Maybe that's a, maybe a, a, a parallel to I'm I, I'm the one to blame or I'm to blame or I, I think it's an admittance of, of of I've taken it as we were both wrong we we both did things in this relationship That's that it. we shouldn't have done uh, it, right? so I'm living in a glass house too um, and you did the same the, thing yeah you know I I've joked about this and I don't know I don't even, I should, probably shouldn't say this but I'm going to anyway my my glass of of riesling has kicked in. Um, did the did, did, did the disintegration begin after the Spice Girls movie and Yuri's production of that? I don't. Do you, do you mean? Do you think that could be a cause of it? I don't mean in any kind of infidelity situation. No, I no, no. I mean like with the girls I and mean, making the movie that like, he like, like maybe, influenced by the. Well, she, I don't know. She was very. I mean, she went and met with the Spice Girls and gave them advice and all that, and so. I don't know. That's that's interesting. It did seem like there was some some bad blood going on during the peace tour. You know, I there were um, reports of Yuri not looking happy while she was signing autographs for fans and things like that. And so there was some tension that was noticed. Um, yeah. Now I feel like I'm gossiping. If you, Annie, if you're listening, I'm sorry. <laughs> Annie, if you're listening, I'm not sorry. <laughs> now that's honesty <laughs> that's that some real honest. honesty there <laughs> we, we we all got to gossip a little bit you know <laughs> i don't know I, I just think it's funny the whole spice girls thing yuri's involvement with the spice girls i did re remember that she did talk with them and, and i'm sure she probably enjoyed her time with them and i didn't mean anything along the lines of yuri with the spice girls i just meant oh no no, no. all seemed to sort of happen at the same time in the album when was the spice girls movie 2000 <laughs> yeah he Maybe. Yeah, somewhere at 2000. I kind of took it like maybe you thought she was disgusted that he worked with the Spice Girls and she was done with him. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It just seemed to all sort of happen around that same... I, I'm just wondering if all of this that we we hear later in, in the divorce album that's not a divorce album, if, if, if all of this was maybe going on around the same time that, that these songs were being created. I don't know. You know... It's interesting that because like talking about me and my poetry, there are points that, you know, like in this new book that maybe I first posted on Facebook, who knows, maybe a year ago, um, that might have meant more then than they may mean now or they may mean something in a different context or something mm. like that. I don't know how it goes. Yeah. I don't even remember the Spice Girls movie. I'm sure I saw it. Yeah. 
I, I didn't it, see it. it. I hope it was short. <laughs> like their career. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go on. Let's move on to the last track. Oh God, oh God, prayer and parentheticals actually. Oh God, prayer. Oh God, prayer. Yeah. Um, it's not. It's not a song that um, that I'm going to play a lot. It's kind of like right. from um, uh, nostalgia. Um, uh, what's the song? Um, uh, I'm forgetting the title of it. Uh, it's 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 the very the song about lynching. Uh, oh, you're talking about the Billy Holiday song, Strange, Strange Fruit. Fruit. Yeah. Strange Fruit. Again, these both of those songs. I mean, just just their just their subject matter. Um, you know, it's not a song I'm going to play a lot, and that doesn't mean it's not a good song. It's and it, it took me a long time to even play Oh God again, uh, because you know it is a it, it's a dark, depressing. Uh, and I love melody, so I, I don't. I, I, I'm, I'm, that's kind of like how I am. But um, it's 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 a deep song, uh, and um, you know, like we said, if we did the Rex Saldana thing and we went backward, it'd be a it'd be some kind of song to start an album off with. But then again, maybe that would have worked. And like, okay, here we are, and we're going to move through this together. It's going to start off really deep. Uh, well, really it would, difficult. It would be unusual difficult. for an album to start with a very odd song. I mean, that's happened. Look at Auto American. Mm -hmm. That starts with a with an instrumental. So you know, I mean, and it's and it's kind of short, right? It's not the longest song. So you know, you could get through that as the first song, and then your next song would be twisted and erased, which are kind of upbeat sounding. So you kind of you know, but well, let's take it even your backward further and we start with the end lyrics and go forward who knows we, we do well, all kinds of crazy I think it's interesting what you said about strange fruit um for you know like you don't you don't listen to oh god a lot right when strange fruit comes on those first few notes they're so melancholy you know those flutes and it's like, and i and i find myself going oh here we go this is so heavy and it's almost like you don't want to listen to it but then you're drawn into it and it's of course it's a horrendous subject matter and all that, but um, but you're drawn into it and it works and so it it is it's it's interesting you can be drawn into these songs it, absolutely and which you let yourself you know you you do go to a different place you do go to an interesting uh, an interesting place but you have you have to let yourself be drawn into it you have right. to let yourself be in that moment so if you're a, if you were just listening to pop music or whatever, you know, it, both of those are going to be kind of difficult for you, you know, to, to, you, you got to be, you got to be in the moment. You got to be in the moment. I don't think Annie Lennox is for the casual listener. No. And you I can think that's what you can never, you could never play your rhythmic songs or Annie Lennox songs at, at, or albums at parties. They're not albums you play at parties. I mean, Maybe you don't think, not play, even you, like a be yourself tonight. Yeah, I guess you could play be party. yourself tonight and maybe revenge, but something like Savage is not a party album. No, and, um, you can play yeah. right by your side. Yeah, even Divas, you know, too too melancholy in parts, you know, and and but I like that. I like that she's not. She does it well. Movie, you know, she I, does it very well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, where's her hard earned sleeve? I think she always has. Worn her heart on her sleeve. I, I think that that there, um, there used to be a time she wore her heart upon her sleeve. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Oh, I love it. I love it. This is so much fun. But she, but she learned. Yeah. But yeah. But there used to be a time. But yet she continued to wear her heart on her sleeve. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what makes good music, right? So well, uh, go ahead, Mark. Go ahead. No, no go, ahead, saying, go ahead. Be we've kind of finished talking about Bear, but before we wrap this up, we have to talk about Clem's book. That's that's out now. It it, it is out now. Uh, he's it's, he's got it out on a copy is on its way to me. I haven't received it yet, but it's on its way. But um, Aww, you know, you. And, uh, of course, I think I said it. And I'm not sure. Sometimes I forget what I've said and what I've said before the pod. But we we kind of asked Clem to come on because again, I look at Bear as such is as a very poetic album, and I thought, well, this is the we actually i've been asking clem hey you need to come on the podcast sometime and i think it fit very well 
And so um, his his book is called The Ghosts of Gold. He, he, has, he has his first book is called In Black and Light. So you check that out too. Uh, it, it recharted this weekend as well. You know, this, this, his new book got to number three so far. We hope to get it to number one. His first book actually got to number one. So if you enjoy poetry, really good poetry, you need to check it out. You can buy that on Amazon. But now, Clem, do you have a poem that you would want to read? I, I'm not trying to put you on the spot if that's not something you would enjoy doing, but we'd love to have you read a poem. Oh, my gosh. Um... Well, I mean, I, I think I have to, since since we're talking about these books. I think I have to. You know, it, it, um, thank you. Thank you for, for talking about them, Mark. And, and, and Rex, thank you for, for ordering copy. Yeah. Um, this has been a, when, when the first book came out, it was the end of uh, 2020. And so we were still deep in COVID country. And um, dealing, I, I never, you know, still until only about three months ago did I get to have my first book signing. Um, so, so I, I, let's see what happens with this new one. But I would like to read the poem is called "Splintered Love Affair," and um, the thing I mainly want you to pay attention to are the last four lines because I told Mark this. Um, if, if you pick up my my books. Um, you're going to get a little explainer. I don't know if you can see that on the camera. Maybe you can't. Can but anyway, the there's a little yeah. explainer. It doesn't matter anyway on a podcast. But there's a little explainer that comes with the point. And I'm going to tell you what this one says. Um, accepting reality and embracing the situation aren't necessarily the same thing. So that kind of goes back to um, wonderful, I think, a little bit of what mm -hmm. I was talking about with wonderful about. You're, you're accepting it or you're embracing it, but it's not really the same thing as, as your reality. Um, Splintered Love Affair, the last four lines, I wrote this with the idea that, that a singer um, is doing this particular, um, these lines, and then the last four are like the backup singer, so it's sort of providing a, an answer and a call and response kind of thing happening. So this is called Splintered Love Affair. And thank you for the opportunity to read this. I appreciate it. After the rain came you, still visibly shaken and unwilling to hear the truth. This splintered love affair is still on your mind, lost pieces of everything you'd let yourself share. Betrayed more easily than imagined it could be, there's nevertheless the trouble with your heart, yet holding on long enough to care. Finding an escape route just at the threshold, you recognize a reasonable likeness of yourself. A life you once knew, held at a level of longing too much to demand. Close to the edge of giving up, before you take what feels like a final bow and say goodbye to lessons in love you no longer understand. There is nothing here for you to find easy as something to let go. Should you kneel down on one knee? Should you enter your final plea? Should you try and hold on to you? Should you give it one last chance to enrapture me? So that is Splintered Love Affair. And yeah, the whole time I was writing that, I was thinking of a particular Scottish singer-songwriter who's been in my head for 40-plus years. Oh, who is that? Um, <laughs> you know, this is so wonderful. Thank you guys so much for having me on and getting to hang out with you all. This is... Uh, well, well, wait a minute. Let me give it that. Hang out with y'all, not <laughs> you all. Um, I got to well, keep thank my Kentucky you for, roots. For reading your poem. I mean, I know you keep, you're thanking us for you. for letting you read the poem, but thank you for reading it because it's beautiful and it was nice to have you read it and and nice thank to have you. that little thank explanation you. at the beginning about the last few lines and all that. So yeah. yeah. But yeah. So I everybody, go out and buy Cle Clem's book. <laughs> Yes, everybody. Everybody, a, go out and buy it. buy for all your Rhythmics fans. Get it to number one. Get it yeah. to number one. Thank you, Clem. Thank you, Rex. It was a pleasure. Thank you, guys. Uh, this was a lot of fun. We'll have to have you back, Clem, to talk about another album. I would love to, guys. I'd love to. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Rex. I love what you're doing. Um, please keep it up. Um, we love listening because this is oh, uh, something that this is our live soundtrack is your rhythmics and Annie Lennox and Dave Stewart. 
I guess we're all just talking about what everybody's thinking about anyway, so that's good. All right. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. <laughs>